Story continued from Ornitholestes' episode. The seasonal rains have ended, and with them gone, the long and harsh dry season has begun. Already the floodplains are beginning to dry out, and some of the larger sauropods that migrated here to feed on the new growth have moved on. But for those that don't migrate, like the Camptosaurus, there is still ample food to be found. Camptosaurus are Ornithischians, not too distantly related to the later Iguanodontids. These 6 meter bipedal herbivores are a common sight at this time, and they live in herds that can number from less than a dozen to over a hundred. One herd of 25 has ventured onto an open floodplain, to graze on the low-lying foliage that hasn't been consumed by the multiple species of sauropod that have trampled through the area. Some of the low-browsing sauropods, like Diplodocus, use their long necks to reach far over the wet soil to get to food, because if they were to step into the muddy terrain, they would sink into it and become trapped. But the Camptosaurus are light enough that though they do get wet and covered in mud, they do not get stuck and can feed safely. During the wet season, they feed on leaves, ferns, and cycads. And while there is plenty to choose from, they can afford to be picky, selecting the softest and freshest growths. However, in the dry season to come, they can't afford to be so picky, and will chomp down anything they can find. Fortunately, they are well equipped to make the most of even the toughest and poor quality plants. Their hard beaks and batteries of teeth can grind down the toughest plant matter, and a long gut means that every drop of nutrients will be squeezed out. They will even eat rotten wood, which can be filled with fungi and insects. For now, they are eating as much as they can while the floodplain is still lush, before it dries out and the hard dry season fully sets in. As the herd feed on the much reduced foliage, the last herd of Brontosaurus move through the area, looking for their next meal. Though some species of sauropod do stay in the general area all year round, others have to migrate in order to sustain themselves, and it is likely the Camptosaurus won't see them till the next wet season. While the giants simply bite and swallow their food, the Camptosaurus have the ability to chew. In the back of their jaws, they have hundreds of tiny teeth, formed into batteries that grind down the vegetation for easy digestion an advanced dentition that their hadrosaurs and iguanodontid descendants will use for millions of years to come. Even with plenty of food around, scuffles do happen from time to time. Males especially don't like other males getting close to them, though this usually starts and ends with a verbal warning in the form of a quick grunt. Today, however, one interaction goes beyond the warning. One male grunts at another to move on, but the second male ignores him. The first lets out a louder bark, and the second challenges with his own bark. Both males face each other, and square up. They are about even in size, so neither backs down, and the verbal battle escalates till both are letting out short, sharp cries and lunging at each other. Both angry, but neither willing to commit to a physical fight. The commotion draws the attention of the whole herd, and those close to the two fighting males move out of their path for their own safety. They are all distracted long enough that none of them notice the incoming threat till the sound of splashing comes from behind them. A few of the Camptosaurus turn around and instantly see the four predators that are advancing on them, sprinting through the shallow water of the floodplain. It is the Ceratosaurus pack, led by their scar-faced leader. The four carnivores have been waiting for the right opportunity, and the arguing males was as good as any. Now all of them sprinted towards the herd, their feet pounding into the low water, splashing it everywhere. It might have given them away, but they are already at full speed. Soon the whole herd notices them, and they begin to run. Though the muddy terrain slowed them down, it also slowed their pursuers. The Ceratosaurus closed the gap between the two groups, and as the Camptosaurus herd made it onto more solid ground, it became obvious which of them was slowed by the wet terrain the young, the old, and the weak. The stronger members pulled ahead, and they aimed to run towards the Brontosaurus herd, where the giants would act as a deterrent with their mere presence. But the weaker and the younger members lagged behind, even as some of them got out of the muck. The Ceratosaurus were doing the same, 
and it wasn't the large female or her mate that pulled ahead, but the smaller male and female. They target a Camptosaurus that had fallen earlier in the chase, his body half covered in mud. The smaller female ran up behind the herbivore, and bit down in the middle of his tail and pulled backwards. The Camptosaurus cried out and dug his feet and even his hands into the ground trying to pull out of the carnivore's jaws. Unable to get free, he is defenseless when the smaller male Ceratosaurus comes up beside him and slams his open jaws into the herbivore's neck, forcing him to the ground with incredible force. The two Ceratosaurus struggle with their catch, but the fight is brief and soon the Camptosaurus is dead. All four carnivores gather around the carcass. This is a substantial kill for them, as an adult Camptosaurus is almost the same length as they are. And there is enough meat here for the four of them. But they barely have time to dig in, as a rumbling sound comes from across the floodplain. All four heads lift up and look into the sound's direction, and they see that walking towards them is a Torvosaurus. The massive carnivore just happened to be walking by when he heard the noise of the fleeing herd, and the Ceratosaurus happened to make their kill only a few hundred meters from him. The huge predator casually walked towards the pack, the deep rumbling emanating from his chest. The Ceratosaurus each rip a chunk of flesh from the carcass and then retreat, heading away from the floodplain to the forest, leaving the usurping Torvosaurus with an easy meal. By the Brontosaurus herd, the Camptosaurus watch as the smaller carnivores flee before the much larger one, knowing that the Ceratosaurus wouldn't try and hunt them again while they were near the massive sauropods. Ironically, the Torvosaurus wouldn't have been able to catch the Camptosaurus, as he is too slow and heavy, and scavenging them is one of the rare instances where he can feed on one. They are a main source of prey for the large carnivores here, especially Allosaurus. And so life for all Camptosaurus is one spent on constant lookout for some of the Jurassic's most dangerous predators. Hello fellow travelers and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down a species that could be seen as a proto-hadrosaur, Camptosaurus. Camptosaurus' first remains were discovered in 1879 in Wyoming by William Harlow Reed, and named in the same year by Othniel Charles Marsh, originally calling it Camptonotus. However, that name already belonged to a type of cricket, and so the genus was renamed to Camptosaurus, meaning bent or flexible back lizard. Over the next century, Camptosaurus would become a wastebasket taxon, with many different fossils that were found both in North America and in Europe attributed to this genus. As time would go on, many of these fossils were found not to belong to Camptosaurus, and were given their own genus. Many different species of Camptosaurus were named, almost all of which are now invalid, but thanks to the tireless work of many paleontologists, we have a much clearer picture of this species than we have ever had. As enough fossils have been found that we have 100% of the skeleton. Camptosaurus belongs to the Ornithischian order, and is a basal member of the Ankylopolexia group, meaning that it is closely related to the ancestors of the Hadrosaurs and the Iguanodontids, which shouldn't be a surprise as Camptosaurus looks very similar to Iguanodon, while also being relatively closely related to Dryosaurus, which lived in the same area at a similar time. That time being the late Jurassic, between 156 and 146 million years ago. In life, Camptosaurus grew to between 6 and 7 meters, stood 1.5 to 1.8 meters tall, and weighed between 750 to 900 kilograms. It was a very robust animal, with strong thick hind legs that bore most of its weight, and had four toes on the end. The forelimbs are much shorter, and have fused wrists, giving them little flexibility. Each hand has five fingers, with the first three having small claws, and the fourth and fifth having hoof-like nubs. The tail was long, being longer than the rest of the body, and strongly muscled to counteract the rest of the body's mass. It had a long neck that in life is thought to have been quite thick with muscle, and not frail and skinny as it is sometimes shown. On the end of the neck was the animal's long triangular head, 
that ended in a hard beak used to crop plants that it ate. In the back of the jaws were hundreds of small teeth tightly packed together into what are called batteries that were excellent for grinding down the mass of vegetation it ate. Wear patterns on the teeth indicate that Camptosaurus was feeding on tough, fibrous plants, including cycads. As Camptosaurus would have been a low browser, it may have evolved such dentition to tackle more hardy plants that some other low browsers couldn't, which is something its descendants would become even better adapted to do. Camptosaurus is noted for having a wide pelvis, which would have been to accommodate a large gut. Like many herbivores today, Camptosaurus would have had a long digestive system to break down plants and absorb as much nutrients as possible. And since it was eating tough plants, this was definitely needed, or the animal wouldn't be getting anywhere near enough from its hard diet. Over its hips, Camptosaurus has what has been described as flexible sacral vertebra. It's believed that these more maneuverable vertebra made the spine and body more flexible, allowing Camptosaurus to twist and turn so it could see all around itself more easily. So though it may have been heavy and robust, it wasn't stiff and rigid, and was able to easily look around its environment in order to detect predators, as well as keep a lookout for other Camptosaurus, as it's widely believed that they lived in herds. And were probably good parents, as being able to scan an area to find lost youngsters or hatchlings may have been very useful. Now much research and debate has gone into whether Camptosaurus was bipedal or quadrupedal. Just looking at it, you would likely guess that it was bipedal, as its arms are quite small and its thick hind legs were indeed capable of supporting its body weight. However, the forearms do have some weight-bearing adaptations. As said earlier, the wrists were fused and the arms were quite rigid, but the fingers aren't packed together and could move independently. So it definitely wasn't quadrupedal most of the time. The key is how it lived. Camptosaurus was a low browser, and so when it would lower itself down to feed on ground level plants, it would brace itself with its forelimbs. Most of the time, however, whether it was casually walking or running at top speed, Camptosaurus would only use its hind legs. This would make it facultatively quadrupedal, so capable of walking on all four limbs, but using the rear two most of the time. Using those powerful limbs, scientists believe it could reach speeds up to 25 kilometers an hour, and it would need to, as it shared its environment with some of the most famous large theropods, such as Allosaurus, Ceratosaurus, and Torvosaurus. The Morrison Formation, where Camptosaurus was mostly discovered, is well known for its abundance of large dinosaurs, especially sauropods. Compared to them, Camptosaurus seems rather small, but by today's standards, it's around the same weight as a Cape Buffalo or Bison, as it was definitely not small and was likely a far more common sight than the massive sauropods, in terms of numbers, that is. Camptosaurus is a very important species when it comes to understanding the early evolution of its family, a group that would give rise to some of the most successful dinosaur groups that ever lived, especially when you consider that later hadrosaurs would go from being bipedal to quadrupedal as they increased in size. But what do you think of Camptosaurus? And for my question of the week, do you prefer Camptosaurus or Dryosaurus, and why? What lesser known dinosaur would you like me to do a breakdown on next? And until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching.